Good morning. It is so good to be here with you. This morning, as we continue our series, listen for those things that your heart needs to hear. So in the wild world of the beginnings of our blended family, one weekend stands out in infamy. It was our first summer in Virginia after we moved from upstate New York, and since we had two properties, a small farm in New York and a money pit house in Virginia, we had to get creative about a summer vacation. So a friend brokered a deal for us to use her friend's cottage on the eastern shore. It was by a river in a remote location. It sounded perfect, and it was a total disaster. Happy Fourth of July weekend. That weekend had all the wonderful elements going for it. There were six of us jammed into a Jeep Cherokee for a five-hour drive, The cottage was, in reality, a beach shack. There was no air conditioning, and the temperatures were in the high 90s with the humidity at least 100%. But the Rappahannock River was right outside our door, and there was a screen porch and a really big fan. How bad could this be? The running list of disasters began quickly because the Rappahannock River was filled with jellyfish, which our children discovered as they all jumped in together. (laughs) Who knew that jellyfish stings could cause excruciating pain, red marks, itching, numbness, tingling, and all of the above as it did to one of our daughters? No swimming in the river meant, somebody better find some games in this house. So we did find one game, Monopoly. (laughs) So the games began on the screen porch, and let's just say it didn't turn out too well. We are all very competitive, and one person, one person was determined to win by whatever means were needed. Very soon, side deals were being made when somebody went to get a soda. Small groups came together to defeat that one person. Pretty soon, nobody trusted anybody, and our disgusted kids got up one by one until there were only two of us standing, and one of us finally said to the other, you really are a jerk, and I'm done too. There were more disasters, including a middle-of-the-night trip to the ER in Richmond, which was 90 minutes away, and a horrible bee sting on the way home when we stopped for ice cream to try and make everything better. But the only thing our kids remember from that weekend is that dadgum Monopoly game. And the memory of that Monopoly game will live on in our family forever. The weekend came back into my mind over the last few days as I was reading a book by Rua Benjamin titled Imagination, a Manifesto. It is a book that needs to be read. In the beginning of the book, Benjamin talks about her experience as a mother who sought to cultivate confidence and courage in her children, not only in the narrow domain of sports, but as they moved freely and fully throughout the world. She wrote about her struggles against the allure of the black athlete stereotype. Yet even with her reluctance around all sports, both of her sons eventually found their own ways as they gravitated towards activities that in the U.S. do not have a large fan base, and have very little black representation. Her point in writing this section of the book is to reinforce that games are serious business. She asserts that games reflect and reinforce broader social patterns of power and inequality. And guess which game she highlights as the example, Monopoly. 
Monopoly has sold over 250 million units since Parker Brothers began mass producing it in 1935. What most people don't know is that the precursor to Monopoly, to Monopoly was the landlord's game. The landlord's game was created by a feminist anti-monopolist named Elizabeth Maggie. Her father, James, was a newspaper publisher and an abolitionist, an abolitionist who accompanied Abraham Lincoln as he traveled around Illinois in the late 1850s debating politics with Stephen Douglas. Maggie, like so many others in her time, was inspired by the economist Henry George's 1879 bestseller, Progress and Poverty. So she decided to create a game to demonstrate the evils of monopoly, inviting people to reject the impoverishment and displacement upon which gross concentrations of wealth depended. Maggie applied for a patent in 1903, and three decades later, Parker Brothers would pay her $500 for the rights. Benjamin explains that although Maggie intended players to experience the game as a fantasy that eats us alive, as it turns out, monopolizing power and resources ends up, for many of us, being the object of desire and not disdain. The reimagined Tenth Commandment from our friends at In Flesh states, Do not let your internal desires lead you to harm another. This wording certainly brings this commandment front and center to where we are as a country and as a world. As we planned this fall series on the reimagined Ten Commandments, our working title for this final week was Greed. Dr. Harris had planned for the Cathedral Choir to sing a piece by Bernice Johnson Reagan called Greed, which I love. But at our weekly Monday morning meeting, I told him I was going in another direction. My heart told me that we were all too stressed and too afraid right now to listen to a sermon about greed. And yet, when I looked at the story of Zacchaeus from the Gospel of Luke that Russell read so beautifully this morning, and as I continued to read Benjamin's book, Imagination, a Manifesto, I knew this is where we would land. We have to use our imaginations to think back to the time and place this biblical narrative came from. The Roman occupation of the world of Jesus was complete and horrific. The people lived their daily lives in fear. They never knew what would happen next. Every time they walked away from their home and their loved ones, they didn't know if they would return or if their family would be safe while they were gone. Most of us cannot imagine living like that. Others of us know these realities too well. The rhetoric was cruel. The language was meant to intimidate and make certain people knew the Romans were the one who held all the power. But they were cunning, and they rewarded those who helped them keep the population under control. The majority of the religious authorities of the day did not go against the Romans. Instead, they made deals and collaborated with them to keep themselves in power for their own purposes. But they weren't the only ones. Within this Roman occupation, many people became not only complicit, but they also collaborated with the Romans and were paid handsomely for the collection of tariffs and taxes. And for those people, everything they knew and believed through their religion became inconsequential 
as they profited from helping the occupiers. So Jesus living in the midst of all this terror and fear sees this man named Zacchaeus who had climbed up into a tree. Zacchaeus was in that tree because he believed it was the only way he could catch a glimpse of Jesus. Jesus stopped in the middle of the crowd and looked up and saw Zacchaeus. I've always wondered why Jesus stopped. Did he know who Zacchaeus was? Did he know what he had done? Did he know that he collected taxes for the Romans and profit, profited greatly from his role in their occupation? No matter how or why Jesus found him, Zacchaeus' life changed that day. Interestingly, there was no need for Jesus to point out all the wrongdoings to Zacchaeus and that crowd that had gathered. They all knew who Zacchaeus was. Apparently, Zacchaeus also knew who he had become. Because when he met Jesus, he was so ready to stop playing the game of the Roman rulers. He was ready to repay his profits to those he had wronged. You see, Jesus enters into this relationship with Zacchaeus. Jesus invites himself to his house and in doing so gave Zacchaeus a way to atone for all the wrongs. Just by his presence, Jesus showed Zacchaeus a way to a new life. We know from history that the Roman occupation continued for decades after the life and death of Jesus. And in all those years, the people lived under the subjugation of Rome's unholy power. And yet, through the stories of the Gospels and the entire New Testament scriptures, we know that people found a way to continue to follow in the way of Jesus and to change their world through entering into relationships which changed all of their lives and their futures. We live in a troubling time. The stakes right now are high for not only ourselves, but for all the people we love and cherish and for all the people across the world. This is a time that calls us to be our best selves, even as we struggle with this unrelenting fear. I believe we are strong enough to face this time. Yes, we need to stop the rhetoric. We need to change the direction. We need to find a way, even in the midst of our fear, to continue to follow in the way of Jesus. It is our only hope for changing hearts and minds. And to change people's hearts and minds, we also have to change ourselves. We have to get rid of our complicity and our collaboration. We have to learn to say no. And this isn't something we can do alone. We have to do it together. I believe with all of my heart that Jesus changed lives because of his love for people, no matter who they were or what they had done. No one was outside the circle of the love of Jesus. I also believe in the well-used proverb with African origins that tells us, if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. We are on the long road. It will not be quick. It will not be easy. And no matter what happens with this election, there will be work 
for us to do. I am not afraid of the weeks ahead because I know we are not doing this alone. And I promise we will walk this path together every step of the way. In a few minutes, we will all be invited to come to this table. It's a table similar to the one Jesus shared with Zacchaeus, I think. And together, we will remember the love of God for each and every one of us. This is a table that does not ask us who we are or where we have been or what we have done. Rather, it is a table for people who are hungry, hungry for love and for the peace that passes all understanding. May this be so now and for all the days to come. Amen.